When I was driving in um, and I was thinking about the neuroscience boot camps that were now uh, low uh, some years ago, uh, I have to say those were among the most fun um, sort of lectures or talks that I've given over the last 30 plus years. And one of the one of the great joys about it was that everybody there was an expert of some kind. You know, most people were fully fledged adults, and uh, it was uh, it was just fun in a way, intellectually fun in a way that uh, was different than most kinds of talks. So, um, so moving on to the talk, uh, this is a talk on neuroesthetics, and it's difficult to uh, talk about aesthetics, empirical aesthetics, without is turning to this person if you're someone who likes history. And often the question is, why start out with such a dour looking person in the conversation about aesthetics? Uh, so for, for those of you, some of you might recognize who this is. This is Gustav Fechner. Uh, and he lived in the second half of the, uh, well, he lived in the 19th century, but most of the work relevant to us happened in the second half of the 19th century. Uh, and there are three things about what he wrote that is relevant to our conversation. It is claimed, and it almost certainly is apocryphal because it's a specific day, October 22nd, 1850, that he woke up with an epiphany. Uh, and the claim is that he had been thinking about, about various psychological phenomena and realized that properties of the world could be mapped on systematically to properties of the mind and that this mapping could take a mathematical form. And out of that, he developed what became known as Fechner's Law, but the general point being that there was a systematic relationship between properties of the world and properties of the mind. Uh, in uh, around 1860, he wrote a book called The Elements of Psychophysics. He's regarded as the founder of psychophysics uh, based on these kinds of insights. So that's number one. Number two is that he thought that if this claim is true, that it had to be mediated through the central nervous system, but recognized at the time that the technology uh, or, and the techniques to access the central nervous system hadn't really developed. And so his claim was that in addition to a, an outer psychophysics, which is what he started to develop, there had to be an inner psychophysics and predicted at some point in the future there would be an inner psychophysics. And in, in a way, much of cognitive neuroscience is playing out what that, uh, that inner psychophysics is. And his third insight, uh, which ended up in a book uh, published, I think, in 1876, but only in German, so there are only bits and pieces that have been translated into English, uh, which is often translated as a primer, uh, a primer in empirical aesthetics. Uh, and what he argued was that there could be an aesthetics from below by that he meant that one could actually collect data, one could find out how people react to things, as opposed to simply an aesthetics from above, which is arguing from first principles. So these three points, properties of the world are systematically related to properties of the mind, that this is mediated through our nervous system, and that one could conduct, one could have a research program uh, in which we actually collected data to understand aesthetic phenomena. So that's sort of the backdrop to uh, what contemporary neuroesthetics is. It's a curious thing that in the second half of the 19th century, you know, these icons like Fechner, uh, Helmholtz wrote a, uh, an article, uh, or wrote a book about, uh, about music. Darwin was interested in aesthetics. And despite that, in the first, uh, I'd say, two thirds of the 20th century, with few exceptions, people didn't really take up this People didn't really take up this, um, you know, this as a, um, as something uh, to consider seriously. There are a few people with empirical aesthetics, like uh, Rudolf Arnheim, I think, was at Michigan for many years, who was interested in this, but it never took on the same force as other uh, domains in psychology and cognitive neuroscience. And to give you a sense of that, um, to give you a sense of that, this is uh, from a PubMed search uh, that uh, using uh, these. Um, using these uh, search terms. So the search terms are neuroesthetics, uh, neuroscience or neuropsychology and art, neuroscience and neuropsychology of beauty. You can kind of see how this is, what an, what an early stage of evolution this uh, field is in. Right? So it's really in the last uh, 10 or 12 years that there's been a rise and we don't know where it's gonna go. So very young field. 
what this means in practice is almost always when I give talks, people will ask a question, often a very good question, and the answer is we don't know because nobody's done it. These are obvious questions, but they're so. And the thing I tell students also is that this is a great field to go into because the big questions haven't been addressed. You're not, you're not concerned about how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin. There are some low-hanging fruit big questions to be asked. So, um, so that's sort of my prelude. Um, and this is a general framework that we've talked about of how to, how to deconstruct what an aesthetic experience might be. How do you actually construct experiments uh, in thinking about this? And the basic idea is that one takes into consideration the design of our sensory and motor systems, that how does that constrain and inform our aesthetic experiences? Um, where, uh, what is the role of emotion and valuation? Uh, often reward systems seem to be important, but how does that, uh, how does that uh, inform uh, or, or flavor our aesthetic experiences? And what is the role of knowledge and meaning? And that encompasses a fairly wide range. It can be personal experiences. It can be your education. It can be what, uh, where, you're grow where you grow up, your cultural background, uh, what point in history uh, you happen to be living. Right? So that, uh, the general idea when, uh, is that our sensory motor systems and our emotional systems are likely to be more similar than different, but our uh, our personal experiences and the way in which semantics and uh, meaning overlays on that are likely to be different. And so again, the general question often is, uh, when dealing with this, is what's common and what's, uh, you know, how do you account for variability, what's common across people and what's different? So that's the general <coughs> approach. So as Martha mentioned that uh, in this, uh, uh, some months ago I started uh, a center here, Center for Neuroaesthetics. Um, the, uh, as far as I know, it's the first of its kind in the US. Uh, and we're focused on vision. So music cognition, music cognitive neuroscience is fairly developed. On the other hand, uh, literature, I think we're going to hear about later, is relatively underdeveloped. Uh, visual neuroaesthetics uh, is somewhere in between that. Uh, and within uh, within what my center, uh, see, uh, we're uh, focused on right now, uh, is what's the nature of beauty and what's the relationship between beauty and morality. Um, the second area we're working on is, the, is architectural uh, built environments. What's the relationship between that and the sense of wellness? I think most of you have intuitions that when you're in different spaces, they can feel very different regardless of what you're doing in that space. So what's going on with that? Are there principles that we can identify? Uh, and, the, and the third has to do with things, and in this case, uh, we're interested in art. Um, you know, they could be consumer products. Why do people, uh, for example, I've been someone who's uh, used Macs all my life, all my computing life, uh, just because I like the aesthetics of that. Even I'm willing to pay a premium for that. So what is it, how does, how does aesthetics of things uh, influence our lives? And we're uh, particularly focused uh, on art with regard to that. I'm not going to talk about the latter two here within the 15 minutes, uh, rather, and I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody about some of the work we're doing there. Uh, for the second thing, including actually working with an architectural firm uh, in Philadelphia where we're designing a memory residential unit from scratch. Uh, so this is one of the rare opportunities that somebody who's in an ivory tower actually gets to implement some ideas concretely and like literally concretely. So, <laughs> That's, it's pretty exciting for me. So going back to this question of uh, uh, beauty and morality, the first point I want to make is that as best we can tell, when it comes to facial beauty, our brains respond automatically to facial beauty, whether we're thinking about, it, about beauty explicitly or not. Um, this is a study uh, I did about, uh, it was published about 10 years ago. Uh, this was done with Jeff Aguirre, among other people. Uh, it's one of the early studies where uh, it's an fMRI study. People are coming in in two different sessions. Uh, in one session, they're making, a, uh, they're making an attractiveness judgment. In a second one, they're making an identity judgment. <coughs> the identity judgment is, have I seen this person before or not? These are all um, 
these are all computer generated images, they're not real people, so they're seeing images in a sequence and they just have to say, oh, I, this person looks familiar or not in the, in the identity judgment. So what we find uh, of note is if you look in uh, sort of the bottom left panel, uh, which is sort of showing you where uh, the fusiform face area is, part of the fusiform gyrus that is uh, particularly sensitive to, uh, to faces. Uh, you have the PPA, the parapocampal place area, part of the this, uh, part of occipital cortex that is sensitive to uh, both landscapes and built environments. Uh, and LOC, which is lateral occipital complex, uh, which is an area that seems to be responsive to objects as opposed to scrambled images. But this is kind of standard uh, visual cognitive neuroscience. <coughs> what we find when people are making judgments of beauty in these faces, that in occipital cortex, there is parametric variation in neural activity based on how attractive the faces are. And it's not generalizable in the sense that this doesn't show up in the parahippocampal place area, but it happens in FFA and adjacent LO. So it's not a diffuse, generalized visual response. There seems to be some domain specificity to this. And when you think about that, it's, there, it's not obvious that that's how it would have played out. If, if I told you the design of the nervous system is the back of the brain classifies things, it says this is a person, this is a place, this is a thing, this is a visual word, and the front of the brain uh, evaluates it, says I like it, I don't like it, I'm afraid of it, right? That would be a perfectly reasonable design of the brain that nobody would be surprised about. But the fact that this response, whatever is going on, is happening relatively early, uh, at least to us, was somewhat striking. Even more interesting was that when people were making a judgment of identity, all they're saying is, I've seen this person before or not. In those regions of occipital cortex, we got the exact same parametric modulation based on how attractive the faces were. And so at least it appears to us that the occipital <laughs> cortex is responding automatically to how attractive faces are, regardless of what people are being asked to do at the time. And around the same time, there was another group that published a very similar study with a very similar design, showing that within parts of our reward system, within nucleus accumbens and medial orbifrontal cortex, there was also an automatic response to faces uh, when they were making a perceptual judgment. In that case, they were making a judgment whether the faces are wide or long, uh, but the, this seemed uh, still to happen. And in our study, again, 12 years ago, we didn't have a uh, very good signal in, the, uh, in that part of the brain. Uh, but you take both of these observations together, and it suggests that our brains are responding to beauty in faces. We don't know if this generalizes to other objects, to faces automatically, and the experience of this, this experience of beauty seems to be the coordinated neural activity of our occipital cortex, our visual cortex, and something to do with our reward systems. So you can ask if our brains have this kind of response, does that express itself in any kind of behavior? Uh, and this is a simple uh, uh, behavioral uh, experiment that we did uh, that is essentially accepted with minor revisions, but still regarded as under review. It's a very simple task. So uh, it's a behavioral task. People are looking at a computer. Uh, there's a mouse on the number below. There are two faces. The faces are irrelevant to the task. All they have to do is move the mouse to the number that is closer to the, the number at the bottom. People perform at ceiling. Super easy task. The critical thing is what are the faces doing? Uh, we normed a whole lot of faces, so we have faces at the high end of attractiveness, faces at the low end of attractiveness, and the sort of the middle, which we're calling neutral faces. And these are not super models, or these aren't extreme. This is just the range of, uh, this was done in Singapore, it's just the range of, uh, of East Asian faces. Uh, so the question we are asking is, what happens when the, dis the distractor number Right? The number that their people are not going to move to is attractive. Does this somehow have an influence on people's motor systems? And 
uh, that is exactly what we find, which is that if your, your mouse response is to the right, easy task, everybody's on ceiling. The attractive face is on the left. Without realizing it, people's limbs just drift towards the attractive face before going to the target number. Right? And people are unaware of them. When they're debriefed, they're, they're unaware of that this is happening. Right? So it almost suggests that there, when we talk about someone being attractive, this is not a metaphor. There's a way in which it seems as though our limbs are actually attracted. Uh, you know, when you hear about magnetic people, like this, there is something about this the way our motor systems are responding to. The other thing is we looked at eye movements as well, and here we saw something uh, slightly different, which is. The eyes were attracted also to attractive faces when they were, uh, when the, um, uh, or when compared to neutral faces. But the faces on the lower end of attractiveness also drew people's eyes, right? So that's why here we had a U-shaped curve, which we didn't see with our limbs. And so what this suggests uh, to us, our take on this is, what our eyes are doing and our limbs are doing are different things. And our eyes tend to be oriented towards what we're calling salience, so things that are on extremes, uh, and whereas our limbs are responding to what is attractive. And the general point being that the same, the identical information is coming through our eyes, and how it gets deployed in our motor systems uh, differentiates whether it's getting deployed in our limbs or getting deployed uh, to our eyes. So an example, the general point being that, uh, that our response to beauty seems to be automatic, and that this response is cached out in our motor systems, uh, at the very least. So going back to this question of this, uh, uh, what's the relationship between beauty and morality, uh, there's been this long-standing notion of, uh, of a, a, a social stereotype, the beauty is good stereotype, uh, people in social psychology have identified, uh, have, have described ways in which people who are attractive tend to uh, be hired more quickly, tend to be given higher pay if they commit crimes, they're given lesser punishments. There's even some evidence that parents treat their more attractive children different than their other, uh, other children. So this is really quite pervasive, uh, and uh, the data of that, uh, while the effect sizes vary, it seems to be quite uh, pervasive. Uh, and there have been, to my knowledge, three studies, uh, this is one of the earlier ones, uh, which asked the question of is there uh, something about the neuroscience of this where, uh, where one can show how beauty and morality converge. And this was an uh, imaging experiment where people, again, are making judgments of faces, and then people are also making judgments of uh, of simple acts, uh, a little cartoon is shown, and people are saying this is a moral act, morally, uh, uh, morally appropriate, morally beautiful act, or not. And so the example here, I think, is uh, there's a, a young girl helping a blind person, uh, which most people would regard as a morally good act. So the main point of their uh, their study is that within orbital frontal cortex, there is a part uh, in which. Both of these kinds of evaluations have common neural activity, and so one suggestion is that this might be uh, this might be the biological uh, sort of anchor for this social phenomena that if we have a kind of beauty is good stereotype. We looked at this in uh, in a slightly different way, uh, again in the context of medicine, uh, which is looking at faces that have these kinds of facial anomalies that can be corrected surgically. So uh, this was a small grant I got from the, uh, from the, there's a center for human appearance here that has uh, various, uh, various uh, surgical subspecialties. So we, we have these kinds of faces. So it's the same person before and after they've had, uh, they've had uh, surgery to correct for their anomalies. And there are a variety of these. There can be skin cancers, there can be various kinds of uh, uh, scars, uh, birthmarks, and so on. Cleft palate, uh, you know, very, uh, it's done a lot uh, at CHOP. Um, and so the first study was a, uh, this was a large survey. Uh, this was done on, uh, on mechanical Turks. And uh, people were just asked 
uh, to answer responses to a bunch of uh, uh, personal attributes to these faces. Nobody is seeing the same face with and without the anomaly, right? So they're only looking at one of them. Some of the faces they see have anomalies, some don't. What turns out quite robustly, when you look at this across participants, if people have these kinds of facial anomalies, they are judged to be less intelligent, less hardworking, less trustworthy, less competent, and so on, with no information at all, right? It just seems to be uh, quite robust. Um, we took this and then uh, looked at uh, uh, looked at the, using the same faces in an implicit association test, um, and I suspect most people in this crowd know what that is. But just to be very clear, again, very simple task, which is people see a face, they respond in one direction if they think it's a typical face, and the other direction if it's an atypical face. They're also shown words. They respond in one direction if they think it's a positively balanced word, the other direction if it's a negatively balanced word. And the idea is that if you have an implicit association with a face and a particular valence, and the motor response is in the same direction, your motor system is primed and you react a little more quickly. Right? And if you have no association, there should be, it shouldn't matter one way or the other. That's the basic logic of this. So we took these, uh, these typical faces, anomalous faces, the same people, uh, and uh, ran uh, the IAT. Uh, we also had people answer, uh, had a questionnaire of what people's own thoughts about their own biases were. Do they think that you have, you have a bias uh, 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 around people who have these kinds of facial anomalies? Uh, and what you find is that, um, what you find is that people uh, when asked explicitly, don't have a bias that is distinguishable from, uh, from a, a null result. However, there's a pretty robust effect size when you're looking at people's implicit uh, biases. Furthermore, it, it looks as though, and this is something we've replicated since, it appears that this bias uh, against faces that have anomalies is more robust among men than women. So men, male participants have a greater bias than uh, female participants. And, you know, it's worth, uh, worth thinking of. I'm, I mean, up until a few, uh, up until, well, a month ago, I chaired a neurology department and was in the position of making sort of hiring decisions and firing decisions. And it's at least worth keeping having a check on oneself right, if you're in those situations of the way in which this kind of bias might play and uh, play in a, uh, our initial responses to people. Um, the other thing to note is if you look at, if you, uh, look at the effect size of people's uh, judgments about themselves and the effect size of their implicit association test, there's no correlation. Um, the broader implication of this is that we, everybody in this room, uh, are pretty probably pretty poor judges of whatever implicit biases we harbor. Um, so, for what that's worth. The final study I'm going to talk about is an imaging study, uh, which is uh, I think just published last month. Um, and this is where uh, people are in the scanner looking at the same faces, and all they're doing is making a judgment: is this a man or is this a woman? Uh, so, they're not. It's not an evaluative judgment. Uh, and what we find is the following, which is that in occipital cortex, we find increased neural activity to the anomalous as compared to the typical faces. So going back to the study that we had published over 10 years ago, you get that same kind of boost, but it suggests that occipital cortex, our, our earlier uh, thought was maybe part of our visual cortex functions as a beauty detector, as detecting beauty. But that doesn't make sense given these data, which is that uh, it is probably more likely a salience detector, that it's sort of responding more robustly to things at either extreme. What was more interesting uh, was uh, what's shown in green, and particularly uh, the medial part of uh, the, the medial part of prefrontal cortex, dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, is that there is actually decreased neural activity to anomalous faces compared to typical faces. So what does this mean? And we don't really know yet, but it is part of the brain 
that is often engaged when people are put, when people conduct experiments uh, to put people in conditions of empathy and to infer what other people's motivations might be, what other people's mental states might be. And one possibility, and this is something that Susan Fisk, who's a cognitive neuroscientist at Princeton, has, uh, has, ad has promoted that this idea that decreased neural activity in this area might be a biological marker for dehumanization. And that's something that we are now uh, in experiments we're doing right now, trying to deconstruct, is that if that's the case, what does that actually mean? Right? On the one hand, it suggests that when people look at, are looking at individuals with facial anomalies, there's a distancing, there's a kind of dehumanization. Uh, but what is, how do we deconstruct that broad sense uh, of what that means? And so we're starting to find some interesting uh, information about people's dispositional attitudes, uh, you know, if you have a, if you have a just worldview that you think you know bad shit happens to bad people, uh, you know that has an influence on this kind of neural activity. Uh, and uh, um, but nonetheless, so this turned out to be one of our more interesting findings that sort of setting us up to uh, ask a series of questions around that. And the final uh, point about this, with respect to society, is the way media plays into this, and this uh, is. Uh, extraordinarily common, which is movies will depict someone with a facial anomaly, uh, and it's they don't have you don't have to develop a backstory, right? You don't have to like people know okay, bad person, flawed face, flawed character, right? That's the, the simple-minded thing, and this message is given uh, to us really early. In, for example, movies like The Lion King, right? So there's a, a, a new release of that. Uh, in the last three weeks, its global sales has passed a billion dollars, and that's the message we're giving. In The Lion King, it's even explicit, right? But all the other characters have names like Mufasa and Simba and Nala. The villain is just Scar, right? It's that's named by by the deformity, uh, and so that's what we're telling our three and four-year-old kids. Linda, thank you.